This introductory module provides the clinical foundation for antimicrobial stewardship, both in the care of patients and the work of a formal stewardship program. We start with the basics, discussing how to optimally use antimicrobials in healthcare. We then describe optimal decision-making when using antimicrobials, including how to approach prescribing the right antibiotic for septic patients. You will learn the basic concepts of pharmacology and antibacterial resistance most useful to frontline clinicians and those running antimicrobial stewardship programs. These fundamental concepts will be applied to common infections in Module 2 and we'll revisit them throughout the course. We are swimming in a sea of antibiotics. Expenditures for anti-infectives in non-federal hospitals were the third highest among all classes of pharmaceutical agents in 2009 and, overall, antibiotics are reported to be the second most frequently prescribed class of pharmaceuticals. Approximately 40% of hospitalized patients receive an antibiotic during their inpatient stay. In 2010, in the outpatient setting, an average of 0.8, that is almost one, antibiotic prescriptions were written for each person in the U.S. One would think that we are all constantly suffering from bacterial infections. If this were true, one may wonder how the human race failed to become extinct before the availability of antibiotics. In fact, however, as much as one half of antibiotic use is inappropriately prescribed. There are a number of reasons that an antibacterial prescription may be considered inappropriate. These include the absence of a bacterial infection or indication for prophylaxis, or a violation of one of or more of the following Ds of optimal antimicrobial therapy. That is, the right drug, the right dose, the best route of delivery, attention to de-escalation, and the appropriate duration of administration. Inappropriate use is associated with poor patient outcomes, including adverse drug reactions, organ toxicity, superinfection, for instance, due to Clostridium difficile, selection of antibiotic resistance, and in critical care patients, increased mortality. It also results in excess costs, not only drug acquisition costs, but costs accruing from the management of complications, prolonged hospital stays, and costs associated with the emergence of antibiotic resistance. The emergence of resistance is increasingly problematic since the development of novel, effective antibiotics is almost ground to a halt. Antibiotics are a precious resource. Antimicrobial stewardship represents an optimized approach to improve patient care and a sustainable antibiotic future. In a joint statement, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, the, the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, and the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society described antimicrobial stewardship in this way. Antimicrobial stewardship refers to coordinated interventions designed to improve and measure the appropriate use of antimicrobial agents by promoting the selection of the optimal antibiotic drug regimens, including dosing, duration of therapy, and route of administration. The major objectives of antimicrobial stewardship are to achieve best clinical outcomes related to antimicrobial use while minimizing toxicity and other adverse events, thereby limiting the selective pressure on bacterial populations that drives the emergence of antimicrobial resistant strains. Antimicrobial stewardship may also reduce excessive costs attributable to suboptimal antimicrobial use. Empiric evidence indicates that antimicrobial stewardship programs are, in fact, associated with a significant optimization of antibiotic use, a reduction in the incidence of infection with antibiotic-resistant pathogens, 
reduced hospital length of stay, and reduced drug acquisition costs. The tactics utilized by antimicrobial stewardship programs commonly include the following. Clinician education, formulary optimization, antibiotic use restrictions, prospective audit with intervention and feedback, optimization of dosing and administration, streamlining, that is, for instance, de-escalation and elimination of redundant combination therapy early switch from intravenous to oral route of administration, appropriate duration of antibiotic therapy, and implementation of site-specific treatment pathways based on clinical guidelines. Effective implementation of these and other strategies necessarily involves a collaborative effort between colleagues with special knowledge of infectious diseases, pharmacy, infection control and prevention, clinical microbiology, information technology, and healthcare administration. The strategies themselves must be based on the clinical science underlying the principles of appropriate antibiotic use. These principles are, in turn, based on knowledge of mechanisms of action and of resistance to antibiotics, their pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, and potential for adverse effects, including collateral damage. And finally, the available clinical trial evidence demonstrating therapeutic benefit. Antibiotics represent a miracle of science that has saved innumerable lives. The use of antibiotics is, however, a two-edged sword. Antibiotics may also do harm, and also by their very nature, their use carries the elements of their own inevitable obsolescence. In December 1940, Albert Alexander, a 43-year-old Oxfordshire constable, developed a severe facial infection after having scratched his face while pruning rose bushes. This led to a severe facial infection and to his hospitalization at the Radcliffe Infirmary in Oxford. The infection progressed despite administration of sulfapyridine until, on February 12, 1941, he became the first patient to receive parenteral penicillin for treatment of an infection. On that date, he was given, under the supervision of 30-year-old Dr. Charles Fletcher, 160 milligrams intravenously, followed by 100 milligrams every three hours. He had observable improvement after having received a total of eight, only 800 milligrams over the first 24 hours. Alexander had been chosen after a not thoroughly encouraging experience in a single patient in a single-dose phase one trial. As Fletcher told the story in 1984, Flory explained that although penicillin had been found to be entirely harmless to leukocytes, tissue cultures, and a wide variety of laboratory animals, he did not want to risk giving the first injection to a healthy volunteer in case of some unique adverse reaction in man. So he asked me to find a patient with some inevitably fatal disorder who might be willing to help. There were no ethical committees in those days that had to be consulted, so I looked around the wards and found a pleasant 50-year-old woman with disseminated breast cancer who had not long to live. I explained to her that I wanted to try a new medicine that could be of value to many people and asked if she would agree to a test injection of it. This she readily did. An injection of 100 milligrams was administered via an antecubital vein on January 17, 1941, and was followed several hours later by a rigor and fever. Th this experience resulted in further purification of the preparation with removal of pyrogens before its next administration to a human. While Albert Alexander had demonstrated continued dramatic improvement with continued penicillin administration, after five days and approximately 4.4 grams of treatment, however, the entire supply of available penicillin had been exhausted. The limited supply was the result of the difficulties in production, which was originally done in covered bedpans, but these became unobtainable in England during the war. They were supplanted by 700 flat 
flat bottomed stackable ceramic vessels tended around the clock by penicillin girls, but the production problem remained. The exhaustion of the penicillin supply for Constable Alexander occurred, in fact, despite readministration to him of penicillin recovered from his urine, which Fletcher transported by bicycle to the Dunn Laboratory each morning. The infection resumed its inexorable progression. Constable Alexander died on the Ides of March, 1941. Once the problem of mass production was eventually solved, penicillin use became widespread. In his December 11, 1945 Nobel lecturer, Alexander Fleming warned of the danger of bacteria becoming resistant to penicillin as the result of its misuse. In fact, antibiotic resistance occurs with or without misuse as a result of the selective pressure exerted on the bacterial ecology by its administration. The emergence of resistance may be rapid or slow, but it does appear to be inevitable. Among the infections for which penicillin proved to be life-saving was pneumonia caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae. The emergence of resistance to this organism to penicillin was relatively slow to appear. Thus, it was not until 1967, after two decades of penicillin use, that investigators reported the first clinical pneumococcal isolate resistant to this antibiotic. The resistant isolate was recovered from a patient with hypogamma globulinemia and chronic bronchiectasis who had received multiple courses of antibiotics over her 25 years. While there were only sporadic reports of resistance over the next decade, the emergence of multiple cases in South Africa and other locations of penicillin-resistant, and in some cases multidrug-resistant, pneumococcal disease was a harbinger of the global diminishing efficacy of penicillin in the treatment of infection due to this pathogen. Staphylococcus aureus took a different path. Penicillin resistance emerged in the 1940s and became pandemic in hospitals in the early 1950s. Currently, 90% of both hospital and community strains are penicillin resistant. The introduction of the semi-synthetic penicillin methicillin was followed within a year by evidence of resistance, which is now pandemic in both hospitals and the community. Penicillin resistance in Neisseria gonorrhea has re can result from a variety of mechanisms, including mutational and by horizontal gene transmission. In each of the above in instances, the widespread use of antibiotics exerted the selective pressure that led to the emergence of resistance. In each, horizontal gene transfer played a critical role. Penicillin resistance in the pneumococcus is the consequence of acquisition of genetic material from commensal alpha hemolytic streptococci, resulting in mosaicism in the gene encoding a penicillin binding protein, the enzyme target of the antibiotic. Gradual accumulation of changes in the gene is associated with progressively increased amounts of penicillin required to inhibit the organism. In contrast, in Staphylococcus aureus, penicillin resistance is due to the acquisition of a plasmid containing a complete gene encoding a penicillinase, an all-or-nothing phenomenon. Resistance to methicillin similarly is the result of the horizontal acquisition of a gene cassette. These explain the slow, gradual appearance of penicillin resistance in Streptococcus pneumoniae and its rapid, abrupt acquisition in Staphylococcus aureus. In contrast to these examples of horizontal acquisition of resistance genes, resistance may also occur by additional mechanisms, including upregulation of efflux genes and genetic mutations within the target organism. A remarkable example of the latter was the result of the selective pressure exerted after the introduction of ciprofloxacin into clinical practice. At one institution, high-level resistance to ciprofloxacin and staph aureus resulting from chromosomal mutations increased from zero to 79% in the first year after its use. These mechanisms 
described also enhance the possibility of multi-drug resistance. Mechanisms such as these, driven by the selective pressure exerted by antibiotic use, have led to the widespread emergence of resistance in a broad variety of organisms. In addition to the examples just discussed, we are dealing with vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing enterobacteriaceae, carbapenemase producing Klebsiella, multidrug resistant acinetobacter and pseudomonas, as well as others. Antifungal and antiviral resistance is also becoming more prevalent. Clinicians are thus caught between Scylla and Charybdis. On the one hand, withholding antibiotics when they are truly indicated may lead to the death of an individual, while promiscuous use of antibiotics accelerates their path to irrelevance because of the emergence of resistance. Every antibiotic use has a potential public health consequence. The goals of antimicrobial stewardship are the optimization of patient outcomes while limiting adverse effects on the bacterial ecology. In this course, we will present a comprehensive approach to optimal antimicrobial use. While there is general agreement regarding the principles of antimicrobial therapy, the implementation of these principles is often difficult in practice. Nonetheless, they provide a basis that allow for the clinician to optimize outcomes in patients suffering from infectious diseases. In general, the use of antimicrobials can be considered either prophylactic, preemptive, empiric, or definitive. Antibiotics are used prophylactically to prevent infection, preemptively to abort infection, empirically to provide initial control of infection in the absence of knowledge of its etiology, and definitively to cure infection of known etiology. Examples of prophylactic antibiotic use in the outpatient setting include the prevention of endocarditis in selected patients undergoing high-risk dental procedures, in the inpatient setting, antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent postoperative surgical infections is another important example. Perhaps the commonest use of preemptive therapy occurs in immunosuppressed transplant recipients to prevent the development of end organ infection in patients with cytomegalovirus circulating in their blood. Although preemptive therapy is sometimes practiced in the realm of fungal infections, there are no good examples in dealing uh, with bacterial infections. In the outpatient setting, common uses of empiric therapy, including in dealing with patients with acute sinusitis, community-acquired pneumonia, and cystitis. In the first two of these, the clinician seldom knows the precise etiology of the infection, including whether it is actually caused by bacteria. Antibiotic administration is empiric in the initial management of urinary tract infections, but may require alteration depending on the results of urine culture and susceptibility, at which time definitive therapy may be administered. In the inpatient setting, the use of empiric antibiotic therapy is widespread and includes patients with community and hospital-acquired pneumonia, fever with neutropenia, undifferentiated sepsis, and others. Finally, definitive or targeted antibiotic therapy is tailored to treat infection in which the etiologic pathogen and its antimicrobial susceptibility pattern are known. We will now focus on empiric therapy, more specifically on empiric therapy in sepsis. The importance of the choice of an appropriate empiric antibiotic regimen in patients with severe infection is evidenced by the fact that inappropriate therapy, defined as the absence of an administered antibiotic to which the subsequently identified pathogen is susceptible, is associated with increased mortality. Furthermore, the antibiotic must be administered as rapidly as possible, preferably within one hour. In patients with septic shock, there is an almost 8% increase in mortality for every hour in delay in initiation of appropriate antibiotic therapy beyond that first hour. 
Other important elements in the choice of antibiotics for empiric use include the site of infection and the likelihood of antibiotic resistance. Furthermore, identifying the presumptive site of infection provides clues regarding the likely pathogens and may also allow for the possibility of source control such as drainage of an abscess or removal of a central venous access device. Clearly, the likely pathogens in each case are different and suspected urosepsis, uh, they are likely to be gram-negative rods, whereas in pneumonia other pathogens are likely. The clinician should also assess the likelihood that the pathogen causing the infection is resistant to many commonly used antibiotics. Elements which might lead one to that suspicion include a history of recent antibiotic exposure, known colonization with antibiotic resistant pathogens, frequent exposure to healthcare facilities, and knowledge of local antibiotic resistance patterns. Also to be taken into account are host factors. Some of these, for instance, might preclude the use of individual antibiotics. For example, the presence of life-threatening allergies to a particular antibiotic or class of antibiotics. Also, factors that might steer one away from certain antibiotics may include an increased risk of related toxicity. Examples include the use of nephrotoxic agents such as aminoglycosides or amphotericin in patients who already have marginal or unstable renal function and especially if they are receiving other nephrotoxic drugs. Of critical importance in the decision-making process is an assessment of the severity and trajectory of illness. How sick is the patient and how rapidly are they likely to deteriorate? What in fact is the margin for error? If I give the wrong antibiotics today, will the patient still be alive tomorrow? This sort of assessment dictates a lot of the kind of decisions that are made in the management of the patient. Other recommendations include ignoring colonization and only treating infection, obtaining cultures before the initiation of antibiotic therapy without in causing inordinate delay in the institution of antibiotic administration and others. Having initiated empiric therapy, the clinician's job is nowhere near completed. The choice of therapy should continually be reevaluated. This approach is supported by a variety of published recommendations, thus the surviving sepsis campaign recommendations state that in patients with septic shock or severe septis, sepsis without shock, the administration of effective intravenous antimicrobials within the first hour of recognition should be a goal of therapy. But they also state that the antimicrobial regimen should be a reassessed daily for potential de-escalation to prevent the development of resistance, to reduce toxicity, and to reduce costs. De-escalation, however, is not the only decision that might be made. In fact, for example, therapeutic escalation may be warranted in some cases. An important reassessment checkpoint generally arises at 48 to 72 hours, at which time much microbiological information is available, as is clinical information indicating the evolution of the patient's clinical status. At this point, a formal antibiotic timeout should be taken and documented. The decisions during the timeout must take into account the information mentioned above in the context of the bug, the drug, and the host. If a pathogen is identified and its antimicrobial susceptibility pattern has been determined or is highly suspected, an adjustment in antibiotic choice may be indicated as in the case of a bug drug mismatch. If cultures are negative, decision making is often more complex and must be made on assessment of the patient's clinical status and trajectory. There are three general possibilities with regard to clinical status. There could have been no improvement. The patient could be improved, or in fact, the patient's clinical status may have worsened. Let's take the case in which the patient is improving. In this instance, the clinician may either continue the therapy, modify it, or in fact, discontinue it depending on clinical status and other available information, such as serum procalcitonin measurements. If a pathogen has been identified, any bug drug mismatch present should be resolved 
despite the improvement, redundancies in coverage addressed in antibiotic spectrum narrowed. Adverse effects of antibiotic use dealt with, dosing issues examined, and anticipated duration of therapy addressed. Dosing should be optimized and consideration given to IV to oral conversion may be anticipated. The issue of the appropriate duration of antimicrobial therapy is sometimes unclear, but in some instances at least national guidelines provide clear recommendation. Thus, it is recommended that hospital-acquired pneumonia be treated for only seven days. Recent data suggests that in cases in which daily ventilatory settings are minimal, that is a PEEP of 5 millimeters of mercury or less and an FiO2 of 0.4 or less, antibiotics may be discontinued after three days. An 80% decrease in serum procalcitonin or reaching a normal value may also allow early discontinuation of antibiotic therapy. The clinical pulmonary infection score has also been used to discontinue antibiotics at three days, uh, but its usefulness has recently been questioned. Decision-making regarding starting and stopping antibiotic therapy is more often than not fraught with ambiguity because of inadequate data. As William Osler said, medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. We can nonetheless optimize our approach by utilizing the principles of antibiotic therapy. This module is on the principles of antibacterial pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics part one. The goal of antimicrobial therapy is the effective and safe treatment of patients suffering from infections. This involves careful consideration of three elements, the bug, the drug, and the host. Also of importance is the consideration of the fact that the effect of antibiotic administration extends beyond the individual patient and the target pathogen, and that antibiotics affect the general bacterial ecology of the patient and the patient's environment. It must be recognized that there are 10 times as many bacterial cells as there are human cells in and on the patient, and that this entire varied and massive bacterial burden is exposed to the administered antibiotic, not just the target pathogen. An important consideration is that different antimicrobial classes affect organisms differently, which is why dose optimization of antimicrobials is an essential component of antimicrobial stewardship. The clinician must take into account host and pathogen factors in choosing an appropriate antibiotic, its dose, and its route and duration of administration. Critical to this decision-making process is a firm understanding of antibiotic pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, also known as PKPD. The pharmacokinetics of an antibiotic describes its disposition within the body, including its absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination, whereas antibiotic pharmacodynamics examines the relationship between measured drug concentrations in serum, tissues, and body fluid and its antimicrobial effect on the target organism. Simply put, pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug and pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body, or in our case, what the antibiotic does to the target organism. Knowledge of these two characteristics is important for the selection of breakpoints for interpretation of in vitro susceptibility testing results, as well as optimal antibiotic selection together with the most effective dosing regimen. When an antibiotic is administered to a patient, the pharmacokinetics describes the relationship between an antibiotic dosage regimen and concentration in serum at the infection site. Pharmacokinetics, however, does not correlate the concentration of antibiotic at the site with the antibiotic's effect. Pharmacodynamics, on the other hand, describes the relationship between antibiotic concentration at the site of infection and its biologic effect on the organism. This effect could be bacterial killing or inhibition of growth. Most drugs are reversibly bound to serum proteins such as albumin and alpha-acid glycoproteins. The extent of protein binding varies considerably between different drugs. For example, only 10 to 30% of total serum concentration of gentamicin is bound to serum protein compared with 90 to 95% of ertapenem. Serum protein binding is an important consideration because one, only unbound drug is thought to exert an antibacterial effect. Two, only unbound drug diffuses into extravascular sites. And three, protein binding may slow the rate of drug elimination, increasing the half-life and thus allowing a longer dosing interval. 
the most commonly used pharmacodynamic measure of in vitro antimicrobial activity against pathogens is the minimum inhibitory concentration, also known as MIC, and minimum bacterial cytal concentration, also known as MBC. The MIC describes the lowest concentration of an antibiotic capable of inhibiting the visible growth of an organism in vitro, while MBC is the lowest concentration of an antibiotic to achieve 99.9% .9 bacterial kill. Although MIC and MBC are excellent predictors of the potency of antimicrobial agent against the infecting organism, it suffers from the static nature of the methods used for its determination. MICs and MBCs do not take into account the time course of antimicrobial activity, nor does it mimic physiologic conditions such as the intermittent administration of an antibiotic to a patient, which results in the target pathogen being subjected to a constantly changing concentration of the drug. The MIC also does not provide information on the effects of the antibiotic at concentrations below the MIC, also known as the sub-MIC effect, as well as the post-antibiotic effect, which is the persistent inhibition of bacterial replication after removal of the antibiotic from the system. In vitro pharmacodynamic modeling systems allow continuous adjustment of antibiotic concentration over time in order to mimic human pharmacokinetics. This approach allows the determination of antibiotic exposure thresholds associated with optimal bacterial inhibition or killing. These may also be determined using animal models of infection such as the rodent thigh model with endpoints that include measurements of colony forming units at the site of infection. The most direct and clinically relevant determination of optimal pharmacodynamics is derived from the study of infected patients, linking antibiotic exposure to microbiologic and clinical outcomes. Such data is unfortunately seldom available. The knowledge of a pathogen's MIC against a certain antibiotic, the antibiotic's pharmacokinetics, the clinical status of the patient, as well as data on intersubject variability is necessary to prevent treatment failures. The consideration of all of these factors and the probability of attaining successful therapeutic outcomes based on the drug pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics can be estimated using Monte Carlo simulations. Monte Carlo simulations use advanced mathematical modeling to apply the principles of antimicrobial PKPD to clinical practice. If a group of patients are given an antibiotic, it is expected that there will be a variability in drug concentration time profiles between patients. The peak drug concentration and the time for drug clearance will vary among individuals. Monte Carlo simulations incorporates the variability in pharmacokinetics among a sample population when predicting antibiotic exposure, then calculates the probability for obtaining a target exposure for a range of MICs that an organism can have to a particular antibiotic regimen. An example would be determining the probability of achieving free drug concentration over 50% of the dosing interval for piperacillin tazobactam against Pseudomonas aeruginosa with an MIC of 8. A commonly used measurement is C-max, which is the maximum drug P concentration, and C-min, the trough, i.e. the lowest antibiotic concentration. By using MIC as a measure of potency of drug organism interactions, the pharmacokinetic parameter determining efficacy can be converted to PKPD indices. Since only the fraction of antibiotic not bound to serum protein is considered active, these ratios are expressed as the free fraction over the MIC. The three most common PKPD indices used to predict drug response are 1. Ratio of maximum free drug concentration to the MIC 2. The duration of time where free drug concentration remains above the MIC and 3. MIC ratio of free area under the concentration time curve to the MIC Understanding these three PKPD parameters, which quantify the activity of an antibiotic, allows us to optimize antimicrobial treatment regimens. The next module will review PKPD of different classes of antibiotics and dosing strategies developed to optimize efficacy as well as minimizing toxicity. In this next module, we will review specific antibiotics and their pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic parameters and how these parameters influences the way pathogens respond to certain regimens and the various dosing methods developed to optimize the antimicrobial activity of an antibiotic. The three most common PKPD indices used to predict drug response are 1. Ratio of maximum free drug concentration to MIC 2. The duration of time where free drug concentration remains above the MIC 
And three, MIC ratio of free area under the concentration time curve to the MIC. For concentration-dependent antibiotics, the goal of this pattern of activity is to maximize the concentration and obtain the highest possible antimicrobial concentration at the site of infection because higher drug concentration results in a greater rate and extent of microbial killing. The major pharmacodynamic parameter that correlates with clinical and bacteriologic efficacy of these drugs is peak drug concentration to MIC ratio. Antimicrobial classes that exhibit this pattern of antimicrobial activity include aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, daptomycin, and metronidazole. Aminoglycosides are a class of antibiotic that display concentration-dependent killing. High peak aminoglycoside concentrations to MIC ratios are correlated with clinical response. Parental aminoglycosides, particularly gentamicin, topramycin, and amikacin, have long been used empirically for the treatment of febrile neutropenia or patients with life-threatening nosocomial infections. Aminoglycosides are commonly utilized with cell wall active agents for synergistic activity for gram-positive infections. For the treatment of gram-negative infections, there are two methods of aminoglycoside dosing. The older of the two approach is to administer multiple doses, usually 1.7 to 2 mg per cake every 8 hours for gentamicin and tobramycin. It has long been recognized that ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity are potential complications of aminoglycoside therapy. Application of pharmacodynamic principles may be another method to reduce ototoxicity of aminoglycosides. Recent data have suggested that toxicity is related to drug accumulation within the air and not peak concentrations. When considering the pharmacodynamic profile of aminoglycosides, there are distinct advantages of using high-dose extended interval. First, giving aminoglycosides as a single dose as opposed to conventional strategies provide the opportunity to maximize the peak concentration to MIC ratio, resulting in bacterial cytal activity. Second, high-dose extended interval dosing minimizes drug accumulation within the inner air and kidney and therefore minimize the potential for toxicity. Also of consideration is the post-antibiotic effect, which allows for longer periods of bacterial suppression during the dosing interval. And finally, dosing aminoglycosides with high-dose extended interval may prevent the development of bacterial resistance. The Harford nomogram is a commonly used high-dose extended interval dosing method for aminoglycosides. This method aims at optimizing the peak to MIC ratio by administering a dose of 7 mg per cake of either gentamicin or tobramycin. Based on renal function, the dose requires modification in order to minimize drug accumulation. Due to the high peak concentrations obtained and the drug-free period at the end of each dosing interval, this nomogram eliminated the need to draw standard peaks and trough levels. Rather, a single random blood sample is obtained between 6 to 14 hours after the administration of the aminoglycoside. The serum concentration obtained is then plotted on the nomogram to determine the appropriate dosing interval. Fluoroquinolones are another class of antibiotics that display concentration-dependent activity. The PKPD parameter for fluoroquinolones is the 24-hour AUC to MIC ratio. An AUC to MIC ratio of greater than 125 correlates with optimal clinical and microbiologic outcomes in seriously ill patients infected with enteric gram-negative pathogens. The fluoroquinolone goal AUC to MIC ratio can vary depending on the target organism. For respiratory tract infections involving streptococcus pneumoniae, the free drug 24-hour AUC to MIC ratio associated with high probability of bacterial eradication is around 30, which is significantly lower than the goal AUC to MIC involving gram-negative microorganisms. The second pattern of killing is characterized by time-dependent killing, which refers to the time it takes for a pathogen to be killed by exposure to an antimicrobial agent. The goal of time-dependent killing is to optimize the duration of exposure. This pattern is most commonly observed with beta-lactam antibiotics. Within each class of beta-lactam antibiotics, the optimal time over MIC varies for different bug drug combinations. Bacterial static effects are typically observed when the free drug concentration exceeds the MIC for 35 to 40% of the dosing interval for cephalosporins, 30% for penicillins, and 20% for carbapenems. 
To achieve maximal bacterial cytoeffect, effect, the drug concentration has to be above the MIC 60 to 70% of the dosing interval for cephalosporins, 50% for penicillins, and 40% for carbapenems. We can apply these principles to piperacillin tazobactam. Piperacillin tazobactam is a commonly used first-line agent, especially for nosocomial infections due to its wide spectrum of activity and safety profile. At the initiation of empiric therapy, the MICs of the organism are often not available and clinicians must rely on the patient's clinical history as well as the institute's local antibiogram to select an agent that will be active against the likely pathogen. In the setting of healthcare-associated infections, it is critical to select an agent and regimen that has a high probability of achieving the pharmacodynamic target for efficacy. For piperacillin tazobactam, its activity is optimized when free drug concentration exceeds the MIC for 50% of the dosing interval. In order to maximize time over MIC, one could either administer a higher dose, increase the dosing frequency, or increase the duration of infusion. If the MIC of the pathogen is 32 mg per liter, the piperacillin tazobactam regimen of 3.375 grams every 6 hours has approximately 30% chance of attaining the target goal which is free drug above the MIC for 50% of the dosing interval. In order to meet the pharmacodynamic target for maximizing time above MIC, one may consider increasing the dose to 4.5 grams every 6 hours. However, the probability of target attainment is still only about 50%. When you prolong the infusion of 4.5 grams every 6 hours to be administered over 4 hours, the probability of target attainment is increased significantly, upwards of 90%. This method of prolonging or continuous infusion of time-dependent antibiotics allow for a higher probability of achieving the goal pharmacodynamic target compared to intermittent dosing and can be especially beneficial in the critically ill population and those infected with organisms that have a higher MIC. Here is an example of bacterial cytal effect of varying drug concentrations for a concentration-dependent antibiotic compared to a time-dependent antibiotic on a strain of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. As shown in the first two graphs, tobramycin and ciprofloxacin display a concentration-dependent pattern of bacterial cytal activity. As tobramycin and ciprofloxacin concentrations above the MIC increases, the rate and extent of bacterial killing also increases as well. In contrast, ticarcillin displays a time-dependent pattern. As seen on the right, increasing concentration results in an increased bacterial kill, however not to the same extent. The additional bacterial kill between concentrations four times over the MIC compared to 64 times over the MIC for ticarcillin are minimal compared to the concentration-dependent activity of tobramycin. As mentioned earlier, another important consideration is the post-antibiotic effect. It reflects the time it takes for an organism to recover from the effects of an exposure to an antimicrobial and resume normal growth, and also the sub-MIC effect, which is the effect of antibiotics at concentrations below the MIC. By adding consideration of the post-antibiotic effect, antibiotic activity can be divided into three rather than two patterns of activity. To summarize the three major patterns of antimicrobial activity, Aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones demonstrate concentration-dependent killing over a great range of concentrations and have prolonged post-antibiotic effects. With such antibiotics, the appropriate strategy is the administration of large infrequent doses, thus high peak drug concentration, maximizing killing, while at the same time, the persistent post-antibiotic effects help to maintain the antibacterial activity between doses. In contrast, beta-lactam antibiotics exhibit time-dependent activity as well as saturable microbial killing, with only little to moderate persistent effects once exposure to the antibiotic has ended. In this circumstance, the goal is to optimize the duration of exposure of the pathogen to concentrations of antibiotics in excess of the MIC. With other antibiotics such as vancomycin, AUC to MIC, which contains elements of both concentration and time-dependent killing, is predictive of optimal clinical and microbiologic outcomes. Understanding the exposure relationship between bug-drug combinations is critical when designing an antibiotic dosing regimen. Pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic characteristics are a major determinant of efficacy for antimicrobial therapy and is essential for rational determination of clinically relevant susceptibility breakpoints. For concentration-dependent antimicrobials, the pharmacodynamic goal is to maximize the antibiotic drug concentration at the site of infection, 
For time-dependent antimicrobials, prolonged or continuous infusion regimens are associated with improved probability of target attainment, especially in the critically ill or patients infected with high MIC or reduced susceptibility pathogens. The role of antimicrobial stewardship is to consider the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of each antimicrobial class and promote the use of optimal dosing regimens for maximal bacterial eradication, as well as preventing the development of resistance on therapy. Now we'll apply the principles discussed in the course thus far to the case of a critically ill septic patient. In this segment, we illustrate the thought processes that ought to be used in selecting appropriate empiric antimicrobial therapy in such a patient. The patient was a 56-year-old, previously healthy man who was admitted to the hospital with a se severe acute diverticulitis. Empiric antibiotic therapy was initiated at that time with ampicillin plus sulbactam. However, the patient continued to do poorly and required a partial colectomy. Ampicillin sulbactam was continued, but on the third postoperative day, he developed confusion, fever, leukocytosis, tachycardia, and hypotension. His blood pressure was 90 over 60 with a pulse of 130 and a respiratory rate of 20 per minute. On examination, there was no evidence of infection of the surgical wound and no other obvious source of infection. The central venous catheter site appeared to be non-infected, uh, but it was noted that an indwelling bladder catheter was in place. Initial laboratory studies found that the patient had a total white blood count of 14,900 per cubic millimeter and that his serum lactic acid concentration was elevated at 3.9 millimolar. Fluids were rapidly administered and his blood pressure improved. Blood and urine cultures were rapidly obtained. Chest x-ray showed no evident pulmonary disease. Because of concern that the central venous catheter might have been the source of infection, the catheter was removed and replaced at another site. A computerized tomography of the abdomen and pelvis was planned and antibiotic therapy was rapidly initiated. The question at this point is, what antibiotics should be chosen to be initiated in this circumstance, and what factors should be considered in making this decision? A critical initial step is the assessment of the potential sources of infection. In this patient, the most likely sites of infection to be considered include the central venous catheter that had been pl in place for three days. Uh, and his urinary tract, which had an indwelling bladder catheter, as well as an intra-abdominal site related to the recent surgical procedure. Another critical consideration in choosing empiric antibiotic therapy is an assessment of the likely etiologic pathogens, an assessment that is, of course, dependent on knowledge of the likely source of infection. With central venous catheter infection, although gram-positive organisms, including ones resistant to most beta-lactam antibiotics, are most frequently encountered, gram-negative bacteria and candida must also be considered. If the catheterized urinary tract is the source, the pathogens are most likely to be gram-negative bacteria. If, however, the source of infection is the abdomen, and caused by contamination with intestinal contents related to a leak from the surgical site, the pathogens would of course reflect the fecal stream and include a mixed aerobic anaerobic flora with both gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. The next consideration is an assessment of the likelihood that the pathogen or pathogens causing this infection is antibiotic resistant. This infection was hospital acquired and it occurred while the patient was receiving ampicillin sulbactam. At a minimum, one must assume that the infecting pathogen or pathogens are resistant to that beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combination. The local antibiogram must be taken into account. In particular, are there multi-drug resistant organisms that are being transmitted within the hospital and or the relevant patient location? Finally, what is the margin for error? How critically ill is the patient? How steep 
is the likely downward slope if intervention isn't optimal? What is the likely outcome if the antibiotic regimen you choose is inadequate? Taking all this into account, our empiric choice of antibiotics should include one or more agents active against staphylococci, including especially coagulase negative staphylococci because of the possibility of central venous catheter infection. It should also provide coverage of enterococci because of the possible intra-abdominal source of infection. Uh, and given that this infection occurred in an inpatient while receiving ampicillin cell bactam, we would assume that an enterococcus would be ampicillin resistant. Anaerobes are likely present if the if the intra-abdominal site is the source. Although the infection did occur while the patient was receiving ampicillin cell bactam, which has excellent activity against anaerobes. Aerobic gram-negative, including multidrug resistant organisms in some circumstances, must be considered. We also must consider the possibility that Canada may be playing a role either from an intra-abdominal or a central line infection. The empiric antibiotic regimen chosen for this patient included vancomycin, which would cover both methicillin-susceptible and resistant staphylococci, as well as ampicillin-resistant enterococci, but would not, of course, cover vancomycin-resistant enterococcus by definition. If the presence of VRE is of concern because of, for example, knowledge of prior colonization or because of a high local prevalence of the organism, the use of linezolid or daptomycin might be preferable for coverage. Gram-negative coverage with piperacillin tazobactam, which also includes broad anaerobic coverage, is reasonable, as is use of a carbapenem, such as ertapenem. Uh, Anti-pseudomonal coverage is not likely to be necessary, so miropenem and imipenem uh, uh, may not be indicated. The combination of a third-generation cephalosporin with metronidazole is also reasonable, given the fact that there's already been a decision to administer vancomycin, uh, which would cover uh, enterococci. Having chosen an empiric antibiotic regimen, consideration must be given to optimal dosing. For vancomycin, the pharmacodynamic target requires achieving a ratio of the area under the curve to the minimal inhibitory concentration of the pathogen of 400 or greater. It should be noted, though, that this has generally been applied to MRSA bacteremia, and whether it applies as well in this circumstance um, is not fully known. In practice, of course, the trough vancomycin concentration, C-min, is generally used as a surrogate measure for area under the curve. Since achieving an adequate trough as soon as possible improves outcomes, it is currently recommended that patients such as this one who is critically ill receive a loading dose of 25 to 30 milligrams per kilogram of vancomycin. This would then be followed by weight-based dosing at 15 milligrams per kilogram with adjustments designed to achieve a serum trough concentration, or C-min, of 15 to 20 micrograms per ml. Once again, it should be noted that these recommendations are derived from studies focusing on MRSA bacteremia, and the target may differ in dealing with infections due to other organisms and other sites of infection. For this patient, the clinician decided on piperacillin tazobactam for broad-spectrum coverage. As a beta-lactam, dosing should be aimed at achieving a pharmacodynamic target in which the serum concentration is maintained above the minimal inhibitory concentration of the pathogen for at least approximately 50% of the dosing interval. The, the precise percentage required varies with regard to achievement of bacteriostatic or bactericidal activity uh, and also uh, to some extent depending on the pathogen, but 50% is within the general target range. The likelihood of achieving this target, especially for susceptible organisms with minimal inhibitory concentrations at or near the breakpoint, is most reliably achieved by use of either a continuous beta-lactam infusion or by prolonging each individual intermittent infusion. 
For this patient, vancomycin was administered in an initial dose of 2,000 milligrams given over two hours, followed by 1,200 milligrams every 12 hours, consistent with his body weight and his normal serum creatinine. Piperacillin tazobactam was administered in a dose of 4.5 grams of piperacillin every eight hours, but with each dose administered over four hours. It was elected in this patient to not initiate empiric coverage for a candida infection. Two days later, the patient was clinically stable and afebrile with normal vital signs. Computerized tomography of the abdomen and pelvis performed shortly after admission did not reveal an intra-abdominal infection. Urine and blood cultures yielded Escherichia coli, which, as was suspected, was resistant to ampicillin solbactam, but was susceptible to piperacillin tazobactam, meropenem, ciprofloxacin, and cefazolin, among other antibiotics. At that point, it was appropriate to utilize the available clinical laboratory information to perform an antibiotic timeout and optimize the patient's antibiotic therapy. In general, an antibiotic timeout may result in the administration of more potent agents or broadening of the spectrum of activity based on the microbiological data, as well as uh, resulting in resolution of any bug-drug mismatches. Alternatively, the treatment may be refined by de-escalation, which may involve eliminating antibiotic coverage redundancies, narrowing the spectrum of activity, converting from IV to oral administration, or in some cases, discontinuation of antibiotic therapy. During the antibiotic timeout, the clinician should also, to the extent possible, provide an estimate of the necessary duration of antibiotic therapy. For further in-depth discussion of the antibiotic timeout and practice applying it to cases, we direct learners to our companion course entitled Optimizing Therapy with Timeouts. For our patient with catheter, urinary catheter-associated urosepsis, IV treatment could be de-escalated de to cefazolin alone with consideration, assuming continued clinical improvement, uh, of impending conversion to orally administered ciprofloxacin. It is anticipated that antibiotic administration may continue for uh, 10 to 14 days, although that may be excessive, with most of the antibiotic being administered in the outpatient setting. The prevalence of antimicrobial resistance is ever increasing. This rising abundance occurring simultaneously in animal, human, and environmental microbial communities, coupled with the easy transmissibility of resistance among species and the paucity of novel antibiotics in the pipeline, creates the consummate antimicrobial resistance threat. We'll focus on antimicrobial resistance in the next two modules. First, we'll discuss three gram-positive organisms in which resistance is common, Staphylococcus aureus, Enterococcus species, and Streptococcus pneumoniae. We'll subsequently address multidrug resistance in gram-negative aerobic bacilli, focusing on resistance to beta-lactam antibiotics, in the next module. First, some definitions. Bacteria primarily acquire antimicrobial resistance by one of two mechanisms, genetic mutations together with selective pressure or horizontal gene transfer. Genetic mutations can become dominant among a bacterial population as a result of selective pressure exerted by antibiotic exposure. Genetic diversity resides within every population of bacteria, including subpopulations that develop resistance to certain antibiotics, often by accumulating random mutations. Upon exposure to an antibiotic, susceptible populations die, while resistant populations may survive and multiply. Resistance is then vertically passed on to daughter cells, creating a resistant population. In the case of horizontal gene transfer, bacteria acquire resistance from another microorganism. Antibiotic resistance genes are carried on mobile genetic elements, such as plasmids or transposons, that can act as vectors transferring resistant genes to other members of the same bacterial species, as well as to bacteria in another genus. We'll point out how specific species have acquired resistance in these two modules. 
It's important to remember that resistance to a variety of antibiotics may accumulate over time, leading to the emergence of multidrug-resistant organisms. Although the incidence of methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, infections in the United States have declined since the early 2000s, it remains a serious global public health threat. In a 2013 report, the CDC included both methicillin-resistant and vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus in the top 18 drug-resistant threats. They estimated that over 80,000 severe infections and over 11,000 deaths are due to MRSA per year in the U.S. Reflecting the global reach of this problem, in 2017 the WHO named methicillin-resistant vancomycin intermediate or vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus as a high-priority pathogen requiring the development of new agents. MRSA remains one of the most common healthcare-associated infections in the U.S., although the incidence of these infections has declined by 30 percent from 2005 to 2011. An unknown but likely greater number of less invasive infections occur in both the hospital and the community. MRSA was first detected in Britain in 1961, the year following the introduction of methicillin, the first semi-synthetic penicillinase-resistant penicillin, into pr clinical practice. MRSA has subsequently spread worldwide. Almost all methicillin resistance is due to the MEC-A gene, although resistance due to the MEC-C gene has been reported, primarily in Europe. The MEC-A gene is part of a mobile genetic element called the Staphylococcal cassette chromosome MEC. Evidence suggests that MRSA acquired the MEC-A gene via horizontal gene transfer from coagulase-negative Staphylococcus species. Community-acquired MRSA is highly associated with a unique mobile genetic element called MEC type 4, which is less likely to carry other antimicrobial resistance genes and is smaller in size, perhaps allowing for enhanced mobility. Beta-lactam antibiotics target penicillin binding proteins, membrane-bound enzymes that catalyze the reaction necessary for cross-linkage of peptidoglycan chains. The MEC-A gene encodes a variant penicillin binding protein 2A, which has a low affinity for most beta-lactam antibiotics. Penicillin binding protein 2A substitutes for other penicillin binding proteins, conferring resistance by modifying the drug target. Two cephalosporins, ceftabiprol and ceftaroline, have high affinity for penicillin binding protein 2A and as a consequence are active against MRSA. Resistance of MRSA to ceftaroline has been associated with mutations in the gene encoding penicillin binding protein 2A. Vancomycin resistant Staph aureus infections are extremely rare. However, because vancomycin remains the drug of choice for most MRSA infections, resistance to this drug significantly limits available therapeutic options. There are two major mechanisms that confer vancomycin resistance. Vancomycin Intermediate Resistant Staph aureus, or VISA, was first reported in Japan in 1997 and has spread worldwide. The majority of VISA cases emerge in patients infected with MRSA who are receiving vancomycin therapy. Decreased susceptibility is conferred by the emergence of chromosomal mutations that alter the cell wall, rendering vancomycin less effective. According to the CLSI guidelines, MRSA isolates with vancomycin MIC that are less than or equal to 2 micrograms per milliliter are considered susceptible, while isolates with MICs between 4 to 8 are intermediate, and those with MICs greater than 16 are resistant. Some studies have suggested that a vancomycin MIC that is equal to 2 micrograms per milliliter is associated with an increased risk of treatment failure but recent evidence does not support this conclusion. Vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus, or VRSA, was first described in 2002 in the U.S. These strains acquired plasmid-borne copies of transposon TN1546 via horizontal gene transfer from vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus faecalis. This transposon encodes for genes that alter vancomycin's target, and we'll discuss this mechanism shortly. Infections due to vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, or VRE, have become increasingly prevalent, especially among enterococcus facium. 
In their 2013 report, the CDC estimates that there are 66,000 healthcare associated infections due to VRE per year in the U.S. In 2017, the WHO included vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus faecium, along with MRSA, as a high-priority pathogen requiring the development of new agents. Treatment of infections due to Enterococcus species can be challenging since these bugs are intrinsically resistant to several classes of antibiotics, including beta-lactams and aminoglycosides, and they can also acquire resistance to other classes. Two species, Enterococcus faecalis and Enterococcus faecium, cause the majority of human disease. Resistance is more common in Enterococcus faecium isolates. Theory was first described in the 1980s after vancomycin use expanded in response to the emergence of MRSA. Vancomycin resistance in Enterococcus species is mediated by the vancomycin or VAN resistance operon. This operon may be carried chromosomally or extrachromosomally on mobile genetic elements. Vancomycin inhibits cell wall synthesis in gram-positive bacteria. It does this by binding to the terminal diala diala pentapeptide that is part of the peptidoglycan precursor, thus blocking the transpeptide linkage of cell wall components and ultimately leading to cell death. The VAN operon consists of several genes, including genes that encode a variable ligase that mediates the replacement of diala diala with alternative peptides that have decreased affinity for vancomycin, conferring resistance. One variable ligase is encoded by VAN A, a plasmid-borne gene that confers high-level resistance to vancomycin by replacing d ala d ala with d ala d lac. The dominant VRE variants of Enterococcus faecium and Enterococcus faecalis worldwide carry the VAN A gene. A less common variable ligase, encoded by VAN B, is commonly identified in Enterococcus faecium isolates in Australia demonstrating that resistance patterns vary geographically. Another variable ligase, VAN C, is chromosomally encoded, confers low-level resistance to vancomycin, and is found most commonly in Enterococcus species other than Enterococcus faecium and Enterococcus faecalis. Emergence of enterococcal species with resistance to second-line agents is concerning. Daptomycin is a semi-synthetic lipopeptide that penetrates the cell wall and inserts its lipid-soluble tail into the cytoplasmic membranes of gram-positive organisms, disrupting its function and ultimately leading to cell death. Several mutations have been associated with the development of resistance to this drug. Linazolid resistance among Enterococcus species is increasingly reported and most commonly associated with prolonged linazolid use, although not all cases are associated with prior exposure. This drug class inhibits bacterial protein synthesis by preventing the formation of the 70S ribosomal initiation complex. Resistant is conferred by target modification, either from the accumulation of chromosomal mutations or acquisition of a plasmid-mediated CFR gene that was originally described in MRSA isolates. Importantly, to Dizolid, the newest drug of this class retains activity in the presence of resistance due to the CFR gene. Pneumococcal disease, whether or not due to antibiotic-resistant strains, is a major public health problem. However, the emergence of drug resistance further complicates treatment strategies. The CDC estimates that approximately 30% of streptococcal pneumoniae infections are due to drug-resistant isolates, resulting in over 1.2 million infections and 7,000 deaths in the U.S. every year. Higher incidences of drug-resistant pneumococcus have been reported in other countries. And like MRSA and VRE, the WHO included penicillin non-susceptible strep pneumoniae as a priority pathogen requiring the development of new agents. Penicillin resistance was first reported in 1978, 26 years after penicillin was first used to treat a patient. The slow emergence of penicillin resistance in strep pneumoniae was the result of chromosomal mutations that alter its penicillin binding proteins, the target of beta-lactam antibiotics. Beta-lactam resistance among pneumococcus appears to be dose-dependent. 
In many cases of non-CNS infections, non-susceptibility to beta-lactams is typically overcome by appropriate dosing. However, given the limited CNS penetration of beta-lactams, overcoming resistance in meningitis is challenging. For this reason, a lower breakpoint is used to determine susceptibility for pneumococcus isolated from the CNS compared with those isolated from other sources. This is also why first-line empiric therapy for meningitis includes both vancomycin and third-generation cephalosporins, such as ceftriaxone, while awaiting culture and susceptibility results. The use of macrolides to treat some pneumococcal infections, such as otitis media and pneumonia, is limited by increasing resistance, the prevalence of which varies geographically. Macrolides block protein assembly by binding to the 23S subunit of the 50S ribosome. Resistance is conferred by the acquisition of either ERM-B, whose gene product alters the target site, or MEF-A, which encodes an efflux pump that expels macrolides from the bacterial cell. The epidemiology of drug-resistant pneumococcus is also impacted by the widespread use of pneumococcal vaccines. Vaccination of children against pneumococcus reduced the number of invasive infections in both children and adults, most likely due to reduced nasal carriage of pneumococcal strains in vaccinated children. However, over 90 distinct pneumococcal serotypes have been identified worldwide, and available vaccines target only a portion of these serotypes. After the introduction of pneumococcal vaccines, so-called replacement strains not covered by the vaccine emerged to account for a greater number of pneumococcal infections, and some of these exhibit drug resistance. Lipoglycopeptides have a lipophilic side chain linked to a glycopeptide and include three drugs, telavancin, delbavancin, and aritavancin. All three exhibit in vitro activity against VRE and MRSA, although the activity of televancin and delbavancin against VRE is largely limited to Van B strains, which are uncommon. Aritavancin, on the other hand, is active against both Van A and Van B strains of VRE, as well as MRSA. These drugs are approved for use in the U.S. for skin and soft tissue infections, and their use in treating other infections requires further investigation. As we've previously discussed, linazolid and tadizolid inhibit bacterial protein synthesis by preventing the formation of the 70S ribosomal initiation complex. These drugs exhibit activity against both MRSA and VRE, although resistance to linazolid is increasing in prevalence. Tadizolid has key structural differences which allow additional target binding site interactions, accounting for its greater potency and retained activity despite linazolid resistance in some instances. Finally, data regarding the use of combination therapy to treat serious infections due to MRSA and VRE or relapsed infections is emerging. To date, the primary focus has been on a favorable antibacterial interactions between either vancomycin or daptomycin in combination with some beta-lactam antibiotics. The pre precise role of such combination regimens in the clinical setting remains to be determined. In conclusion, antimicrobial resistance in gram-positive organisms presents a serious global public health risk. Slowing the further emergence of resistance depends on the prudent use of antibiotics. And treating infections due to these resistant bugs will depend on the development of more effective antibacterial agents. The prevalence of antimicrobial resistance among gram-negative organisms is ever-increasing. This rising abundance occurring simultaneously in animal and environmental populations coupled with the easy transmissibility of resistance mechanisms among species and the paucity of novel gram-negative targeted agents in the antimicrobial pipeline creates the consummate antimicrobial resistance threat. In this section, we will review the major mechanisms of resistance among gram-negative organisms, with particular focus on clinically significant organisms causing healthcare-associated infections. In a 2013 report on antimicrobial resistance threats in the United States, the Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, identified resistant gram-negative organisms 
particularly carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae, as among the top three drug resistance threats to the United States. This report set the stage for increased focus on research and mitigation of resistant gram-negative organisms, especially in healthcare settings. It also highlighted the poor outcomes often associated with drug-resistant gram-negative infections. For example, approximately 50% of hospitalized patients with CRE bloodstream infections expired due to their infection. While this module is necessarily too short to cover every resistance mechanism and therapeutic option, we will review major trends in the evolution and epidemiology of gram-negative resistance, diagnosis and therapy of resistant gram-negative organisms, including key classes of gram-negative resistance, combination therapy, and recently approved therapeutic options. As was already alluded to in the introductory resistance module, the major mechanisms by which bacteria develop resistance include 1. Selective pressure from antimicrobial use which allows for the selection of drug-resistant strains to emerge, and 2. Horizontal transfer of resistance including genetic material among bacteria, including from plasmids or other mobile genetic elements. Exchange of genetically mediated resistance mechanisms is extremely prevalent among gram-negative organisms and can result in a single organism simultaneously acquiring multiple resistance elements. Until recent years, much of the concern about gram-negative resistance has focused on expression of extended-spectrum beta-lactamases, abbreviated ESBLs. ESBLs are plasmid-mediated enzymes that confer resistance to most beta-lactam-based antibiotics, and they were first identified in the 1960s and increasingly recovered from patients, especially in Europe, throughout the 1980s and 90s. These resistant organisms were predominantly identified in hospitalized patients and a cause of great concern because of their ability to cause extensive outbreaks. Initial ESBL isolates arose as a consequence of mutations in the widespread plasmid-encoded TAM1 and SHV1 beta-lactamases. To date, hundreds of different TAM and SHV varieties have been identified based on varying amino acid substitutions conferring resistance. Other varieties of ESBLs include CTXM and OXA, in addition to other more rare or geographically restricted enzymes. ESBL-producing Enterobacteriaceae have become widespread causes of HAIs and are increasingly found as the cause of community-acquired infections, especially of the urinary tract. The widespread emergence of community-associated ESBLs has been tied to the ascension of E. coli, a common member of the human gut flora, as the predominant Enterobacteriaceae harboring the ESBL enzyme, and specifically to the emergence of CTXM, an ESBL carried by plasmids and expressed by environmental organisms that are easily acquired by E. coli. While global rates of community carriage of ESBL Enterobacteriaceae have exploded since 2008, carriage rates have varied geographically. Epidemiologists, noting the global dissemination and distribution of ESBL producing organisms, highlighted the significant intra- and inter-regional variations in ESBL carriage. Although data acquisition and community surveillance differ markedly across the world, Southeast Asia, the Western Pacific, and Eastern Mediterranean have all been identified as areas with a high prevalence of ESBL community carriage. Data from the African continent is limited and may not reflect the true burden of ESBL within this geographic region. Identifying areas with high rates of ESBL Enterobacteriaceae is important in assessing the risk for the spread of antimicrobial resistance by international travelers. In one study from the Netherlands, 34.3% of travelers who were initially ESBL negative acquired ESBL Enterobacteriaceae during international travel, particularly when they traveled to areas of high endemicity. 
ESBL producing gram negative strains remain problematic and their emergence led to the increased use of carbapenems, which are generally considered the antibiotics of choice for treating infections due to these organisms. Unfortunately, a newer problem has emerged, namely carbapenem resistant Enterobacteraceae, abbreviated CRE, and other carbapenem resistant gram negatives. While multiple mechanisms may account for the carbapenem resistance phenotype, the ma major concern since the early 1990s has been the emergence of enzymes that disable carbapenems. This mechanism was originally identified in Pseudomonas and Serratia in the early 1990s and became widespread with the isolation of these enzymes from Klebsiella in the late 1990s. This discovery led to the well-recognized abbreviation KPC, which corresponds to Klebsiella pneumoniae producing carbapenemase. These enzymes efficiently hydrolyze nearly all beta-lactam antibiotics, including carbapenems. Carbapenemases are no longer limited to Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, and Serratia, and in fact, most Enterobacteraceae can acquire this resistance mechanism through plasmid-mediated acquisition of the enzyme. KPCs constitute one example of the Ambler Class A enzymes. Many other carbapenemases belong to Class B, which includes the metallobeta-lactamases, abbreviated MBLs, while Ambler Class D contains OXA-type enzymes. These resistance enzymes have been identified in several different gram-negative genera, including several of the Enterobacteraceae family, Acinetobacter, and Pseudomonas. Among MBLs, NDM, or New Delhi metallobeta-lactamases, have garnered significant recent attention as a major emerging threat because of their easy transmissibility thanks to a relatively stable plasmid backbone and the association with medical tourism and other travel-related exposure. Cephalosporin use remains a significant risk factor for acquisition and colonization with these resistant gram negatives and is thus a main focus of many stewardship efforts. These highly resistant organisms also present a unique threat to immunocompromised patients. A recent review of the global burden of carbapenem resistant infections in neutropenic patients highlighted the emergence of carbapenem resistance among cancer patients over the last two decades, with the majority of the growth occurring since 2005. Further contributing to difficulty in the clinical management of carbapenemase producing bacterial isolates is the fact that these organisms frequently also express resistance to other drug classes, for example, resistance to aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones may be transmitted via the same plasmid. Alarmingly, this leads to drastically limited therapeutic options. Additional mechanisms to avert antimicrobial therapy employed by gram-negative bacteria include porin mutation, efflux pumps, and inducible AMPC beta-lactamase enzymes. For example, quote, spice organisms chromosomally encode an inducible beta-lactamase enzyme called AMPC. Members of this group include Serratia, Providencia, Indole-positive Proteus species, Citrobacter, and Enterobacter, although both Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas may also carry genes that include AMPC. AMPC, whose product is predominantly a cephalosporinase and is not inhibited by most available beta-lactamase inhibitors, may also be carried and expressed in plasmids. The major importance of the inducible AMPC is that, particularly in Enterobacter, Small numbers of derepressed mutants can constitutively produce the enzyme in large amounts, and these mutants can be selected during treatment with third-generation cephalosporins. Concerns about treatment failure due to this mechanism account for the admonition against the use of third-generation cephalosporins in the treatment of serious enterobacter infections. ESBLs may also be present in spice organisms, 
further complicating both laboratory identification and antimicrobial therapy. It can be difficult to phenotypically distinguish among these mechanisms depending on the method of laboratory identification employed. For example, it can be quite difficult to differentiate among resistance due to chromosomal AMPC, drug impermeability, and carbapenemase production. The emergence of widespread resistance among Enterobacteraceae, as well as other gram-negative organisms, prompted the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, abbreviated CLSI, and its European counterpart, UCAST, to reevaluate the breakpoint criteria for determining susceptibility of organisms to several antimicrobials. Although carbapenems remain the mainstay of therapy for ESBL-producing organisms, therapeutic options for carbapenemase-producing bacteria are less clear. Clinicians must choose from a limited array of remaining antibiotics most likely to be active, and these choices often include drugs with significant toxicities and side effect profiles, for example, gentamicin, tigacycline, colistin, and polymyxin B. Combination therapy with multiple agents, often including, paradoxically, treatment with an optimally dosed carbapenem, appears to have some clinical advantage over monotherapy, particularly when it comes to engendering resistance, and may perhaps have a mortality benefit. The data supporting combination therapy is derived mostly from observational retrospective cohorts and outbreak investigations, with all the limitations that those types of studies entail. The most common combination therapies include a carbapenem plus tigacycline, and either an aminoglycoside or a polymyxin. Other agents have also been reported as part of combination regimens for treatment of carbapenem-resistant infections, including rifampin, based on in vitro data, and phosphomycin, the IV formulation of which is not available in the U.S. Estreonam has also been included in combination regimens despite high-level resistance in order to exploit its competitive inhibition of MBLs. Ultimately, the selection of components of combination therapy likely depends on patient clinical characteristics such as site of infection and the type of carbapenemase being produced. Infections caused by multidrug resistant Acinetobacter have extremely limited therapeutic options, often restricted to polymyxin, tigacycline, and sulbactam. Limited studies of these agents used either as monotherapy or in combination, including synergistic combination therapy, have been reported, and seemingly there is no obvious first-line therapy. Finally, minocycline, initially available in the 1960s and voluntarily withdrawn from the U.S. market in the IV formulation in 2005, reappeared as a therapeutic option for MDR infections in 2009. Various synergistic combinations of minocycline with a variety of antimicrobials have been evaluated in vitro and in vivo, but never in a randomized controlled trial. While many older antibiotics have been resurrected for the management of resistant gram-negative organisms, two new agents have recently come to market for the treatment of intra-abdominal infections and complicated urinary tract infections. Because of limited therapeutic options for gram-negative resistant organisms, they have been used in patients with highly resistant gram-negative infections at other sites and who have failed other therapies. Ceftazidime avibactam is a new beta-lactam plus inhibitor combination therapy employing a novel beta-lactamase agent. Limited anecdotal clinical data hints that it may hold promise for the treatment of infections due to carbapenemase producers, while laboratory data suggests this agent has inhibitory capability across multiple Ambler classes, including KPCs and possibly some MBLs. Ceftolazane tazobactam is a novel cephalosporin plus beta-lactamase inhibitor combination with enhanced stability against AMP-C enzymes and typically exhibits a lower MIC to Pseudomonas species. Coverage of AMP-C containing organisms is not uniform, however, and this agent does not have activity against two of the most worrisome mechanisms of gram-negative resistance, KPCs and MBLs 
thus limiting its therapeutic utility. In conclusion, antimicrobial resistance in gram-negative organisms is a worrisome threat, especially in the context of healthcare-associated infections, due to the multiplicity of resistance mechanisms and their easy transmissibility among multiple species. The problem of gram-negative resistance is further complicated by extremely limited novel therapeutic options and the substantial side effect profiles of resurrected antimicrobial therapies. Mitigation and management of gram-negative resistance depends in large part on the prudent use of existing antibiotics, attention to appropriate laboratory diagnosis, the use of combination therapy, and standard infection control and stewardship practices.